Even as he fought against other Chinese kingdoms and his own demons, Shi Huangdi began to garrison nearly 700,000 men near his capital in central China to build the most personal of all his engineering projects, an epic tomb he had begun planning at the age of 13. This was a monumental project that required the labor of thousands and thousands of people over a very long time. It was, by design, the biggest and best tomb that China had ever known. In 1974, farmers digging a well came face to face with an ancient Chinese warrior. The mysterious terracotta skull would prove the gateway to one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. The mound is huge. The mound was always known to be the tomb mound of the first emperor. What was a total surprise was the uh, army of terracotta warriors about a kilometer to the east of the tomb, who presumably were guarding the approach to the tomb itself. Season after season of excavation since the 1970s has yielded more than five large pits. The individualized faces and drapery and armor suggest that each one of these warriors was molded from the life from an individual separate human being. The precision and detail in the sculpting, the firing of the clay are unmatched today. These warriors are a colossal achievement and some believe the greatest archaeological find of the 20th century. But they are only the tip of the iceberg because this ghost army only served as a guard detail for an engineering feat as fantastic as the world has ever known, the opulent tomb of Shu Hongdi. Each statue stands between five feet eight inches and six feet two inches tall, giants for the time. Some weighed up to 600 pounds, but it was the terracotta itself that sent shockwaves through the teams excavating the site. The clay had a hardness beyond anything they'd ever seen before, indicating that Shi Huangdi's artisans had developed a revolutionary new technology, blast furnace kilns that fired the statues at temperatures up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Archaeologists eventually uncovered three massive pits filled with the terracotta army guarding the first emperor's tomb. One pit alone contains over 6,000 life-size warriors and horses in battle formation. In a second pit, 1,300 of Shi Wangdi's elite military forces, including archers, chariots, and cavalry were discovered. While the third pit, with 68 figures and one chariot, was the command center of the entire army, headquarters for the defense of Shi Wangdi's empire even in death. The military armor is fairly specific. We can tell that the uh, armor used was lacquered leather. We can see that people had cleats on the bottom of their boots to help them run in the mud. We can see the kinds of caps people wore and associate them with rank. 30-foot walls divided the massive complex, which stretches out for 7,000 yards into three parts, the outer city, an inner city, and then the mausoleum itself. During construction of the tomb, an army of workers excavated a gigantic terraced pit measuring about 1,600 feet by 1,700 feet, equal to 580 basketball courts. When the sprawling tomb complex was complete, it was topped with a terraced mountain of earth nearly 400 feet tall. At the time, it may have been nearly as large as the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. But over 2,000 years, weather has worn down the original man-made mountain to about 250 feet. It's hard to believe that something like that could be purely the product of human labor, but it is. That mound was put there basket full of earth after basket full of earth uh, to cover what we assume is, is an entire underground city dedicated to the afterlife of the first emperor. 
Zhe Huang Di's tomb is definitely the expression of a guy who wanted his empire to blow away everything the world had ever known. The ceiling is said to be a night sky studded with constellations made out of pearl. The floor, an entire recreation of his empire in miniature with pavilions and pagodas by a flowing river of mercury. The king himself laid out in gold and jade in a bronze coffin floating on a pool of mercury. Now, all this is pretty fantastic and mind-blowing, but is it true? Well, scientific tests have proven mercury levels 100 times the norm around the mountain, and ground-penetrating radars detected a room inside the mountain 33 feet high. So the emperor's tomb may be all it's cranked up to be, but we're going to have to wait to find out, because the Chinese government has decided not to excavate the place until they have the technology to preserve what's inside. And even then, once they go in, it may be a very treacherous dig. There were corridors and trap doors and booby traps that were designed to prevent tomb robbing. Now, we assume that those are no longer operable after a couple thousand years, but I'm sure whoever goes into that tomb first is going to step carefully. Xie Huangdi had boasted the Qin Dynasty would last 10,000 generations. But just three years after his mysterious death, the vast empire collapsed. The first emperor paid a steep price for his epic engineering projects. The Great Wall and magnificent tomb bankrupted the country and ultimately broke the backs of China's peasants. Pushed to their limits, the people revolted and China was plunged into chaos. Xi Wang Di is said to have died from ingesting mercury, which he believed to be an elixir of immortality. Xi Wang Di, the first emperor of a united China, is dead. Few mourn. Many have eagerly anticipated an end to the hated and ruthless Qin dynasty. A vicious power struggle ensued for control of the empire. In a word, it was chaotic. Very quickly, after the death of Qin Shi Huangdi, things fell into civil war with various people vying for power. 206 BC, a new ruler comes to power determined to bring stability to China. His name was Liu Bang, a former soldier and cunning politician who knew how to win the hearts and minds of the people. Over the next four years, Liu Bang consolidated his rule and rallied the people behind him. Peace and stability returned to the empire. By the time he died in 195 BC, he had launched a dynasty that would thrive for nearly four centuries, the Han. The Han embarked on a wall-building campaign even more massive than Xi Huangdi's. They extended the Great Wall much further to the west than it had been and set up a set of garrisons and a series of watchtowers that guarded the trade routes out into Central Asia uh, for hundreds of miles to the northwest of the capital. The Han built their fortresses at closer intervals than earlier dynasties, every one to three miles. In areas of heavy enemy activity, that could increase to only 500 yards apart. 